The following podcast contains spoilers and rude words. Mate, did we watch a thing this week? Yeah, we did. Hey, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for joining us. Um, this is where we watched a thing. That means, Billy, you must be my friend Billy. <laughs> <laughs> Who did you think you were talking to, mate? Yes, it's me. No, it all makes sense. <laughs> How are you, my friend? I'm okay, mate. I'm okay. Do you know one reason I'm happy? What's that? I realised you owe me $10. Do I? I mean, that, that does track. That sounds like me. But what's the specific reason? It could be anything. Did did you buy me nuggets? Did we make a bet? Like, Actually, no, you bought me nuggets. I, I did, so it all checks out then. <laughs> Avengers Endgame was not nominated for Best Picture. Oh, yeah. It occurred to me. Yeah, yep. It sure wasn't. Yep. And you owe me 10 bucks. Okay, but I did buy you nuggets last night, in fact. So I think- Literally last night. Let's call- I think we're fine. Let's call it square. I mean, nuggets aren't exactly 10, but like the Oscars were a long time ago. So I think by the time you take inflation into account- You're saying that the bet has depreciated. Yes, absolutely. Yes. I thought maybe there'd be like some- some some interest, maybe. No, no, no. I'm telling you right now, no one's interested in this. <laughs> <laughs> but we're not talking about Endgame or Nuggets this week. What are we talking about, my friend? Um, Judd Apatow has a new film. Yes, he does. And it's out. It's available to watch. A brand new film. 2020, shaping up, man. I think we're doing all right, actually, considering all cinemas have been closed for months. <laughs> Thank God for streaming. Yeah, thank God. Can you imagine if, well, I was going to say, could you imagine if this was before streaming? But really, could could you imagine what, like, the 1918 pandemic would have been like with no anything? Just nothing. Oh, that would have been rough as guts, wouldn't it? Did they even have plumbing? Maybe not. Maybe that's how they got into that situation. That'd Just do it. shitting all over each other. Like back when the Thames used to smell like your toilet, because it in fact kind of was- <laughs> Your toilet. (laughs) All right. So The King of Staten Island is a 2020 American comedy drama film directed by Judd Apatow from a screenplay by Apatow, Pete Davidson and Dave Cyrus. It stars Davidson, Marissa Tomei, Bill Burr, Belle Powie, Maud Apatow and Steve Buscemi. And what's it about, Toph? Uh, It is a semi-autobiographical drama in a comedy's clothes about Pete Davidson. Yes, Yes, comedian and Saturday Night Live star. Have you seen Pete Davidson prior to this? Do you know anything about who he is or his comedy? I have no relationship to Pete Davidson. Yeah, that's um, what I, I could was have walked past Pete Davidson on the street and not known it. Okay, do you feel like that may have hindered this film for you, or maybe it made it better, or do you just think that had zero effect on you at all? Hmm. I, I don't know. I don't know. Okay. Well, let me ask you this. After seeing the film, do you like Pete Davidson, would you say? I do. I'm on board. Yeah. I think Pete Davidson is funny. I think he's hysterical. It's one of the the major things I look for in a comic. (laughs) Yes. The best bits of his SNL appearances are when- They just let him be him. One of the the great things he does is during the news update segment, where usually they'll have, you know, like Adam Sandler, for example, used to do news update as an opera singer, and he would come out and and sing. You know, they they usually still perform as characters. But what's really great is when they bring Pete Davidson out, they literally just bring him out and let him do, say, five minutes of of stand-up. And it is just hysterical. The dude is funny. And- (laughs) Like, he's so unlike us. He's very, very clearly a drug addict who has many mental health issues, but he jokes about that in such a charming, down-to-earth way. It's it's really a lot of fun. And I really liked this movie because of mainly him, I think. One criticism that you could level at the film is that maybe it needs more Pete Davidson. That's an interesting take. It It is very Pete Davidson-centric, but in some ways I know what you mean. I kind of get what you're saying there. Even though I would say he's probably in every scene of the film, isn't he? Well, if not close to, yeah. But you feel like more of his personality could come through. Yeah, and there's just in in scenes involving the the satellite characters, who are really strong, mind you. Yeah. Um, Apatow really makes the film that he shares the scenes with them mm. more so than- 
all right, this is definitely Pete Davidson's scene and also this character's there as well. And, like, okay, like, the supporting cast is fantastic, but as someone who was, like, discovering Pete Davidson as I was watching this, I was probably kind of like, I I want this guy doing more. Yeah, okay, but you know what, what I have to say about that is it's kind of like watching an episode of Seinfeld where Jerry is hysterical and lovable. But if you try pin any actual story or drama on Jerry, you're going to have a bad time because the dude can't act. <laughs> and I felt that a little bit with Pete Davidson. There are, there are moments in this film that are really funny. And, and he actually reminded me a lot of Seinfeld in this, in that there's a lot of kind of some of the funny scenes have nothing to do with actually what's happening. It's just him basically doing stand up on screen. <laughs> yeah. But I, it's funny for a film that is quite dramatic could you really point to any scenes where the drama comes from him? Usually it's people reacting to him or worrying about him. You know, Marissa Tomei or, or his sister. It's There's very little drama that actually hinges on Pete Davidson. And so I do think he's required to play off those supporting characters a little bit more because he's really not capable of delivering that. And I actually think that it's very smart that they were aware of that, I think. Yeah, I mean, there's the odd scene like where he's- when he finds out about um, Bill Burr's character and he kind of goes and he's standing next to the the kind of shrine to his dad. Yeah. And he kind of loses there a little bit. But you're talking- Yeah, it is few and far between in a film that's well and truly more than two hours. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's a long movie, as as most Apatow movies are. It's classic. I mean, Judd Apatow, bless him, I swear to God, has never listened to an editor in his life. And good on him for it, honestly. Okay, I disagree with that. I like we and I disagree with every Judd Apatow film ever. And I like Judd Apatow films. I find them enjoyable. But most of them that are 2 hours 20 should be 2 hours. I think it's amazing that he's managed to have the career that he's had, honestly. Like it's amazing that he has become a household name when I think this might be like the most Apatow movie ever. It's virtually 50/50 comedy drama. It's longer than it should be. It's It's got a sense of kind of quirkiness. I would not call this a mainstream movie. So I do think it's amazing that he's had the kind of career that he's had, really, given that this kind of movie is his bread and butter. He's he's basically an indie director who somehow rose to a mainstream name. With the runtime of this film, there's just- And it's it's not like any specific side- pl- not, not even necessarily side plot, just his interactions with different characters. I don't dislike any of them. Yeah. But in a film that's that's two hours twenty is it two twenty, two twenty five or something? Yeah, two twenty, yeah. The interactions with his sister are really good. And she's really good. Played by Judd Apatow's daughter. I didn't know that. Yeah. Yep, that's Maud Apatow. That's that's uh his and Leslie Mann's offspring. Well, I thought she was good. Then you've got the stuff with his friends and and the robbing of the drugstore, which it like it's quite good. It's all good. But at some point, you're like, you could lose, like, pick a thread. You could lose one of these threads, and ultimately, I actually don't think the film would suffer for it. It would just move along at a better clip. Yeah, I agree, because like a lot of of good Apatow movies, it, this is really more of a character study, really. Like, as you, you, you barely even- you- kind of couldn't even find a right word for it. They're not really subplots. Thread, I think, was a good word, or vignettes, because they are kind of- they're unrelated, but because they're through the lens of the character, they are related. Yeah, it's almost episodic. Yeah, exactly. So, you easily could lose any of those segments. You know, the, the fight club at work, for example, completely irrelevant. You could lose it instantly. Yeah, but funny. Definitely funny, as you, as you want in a comedy. That's <laughs> <laughs> what you're looking for. <laughs> So, yeah, on on the cast and the supporting cast, I loved Pete Davidson. I loved Maud Apatow. I thought that this was uh, Marissa Tomei's best role in years. Yeah, I thought she was unsurprisingly very good. She Um, was fantastic, yeah. Marissa Tomei is just very good. She really is. (laughs) Yeah, I think the revelation probably in a lot of her scenes is Bill Burr, who I I don't think I've ever seen Bill Burr act before. I was actually just thinking the same thing. I was trying to work out if he had. That Mo was horrific, wasn't it? <laughs> oh, no good. That was just a bad, bad Mo. <laughs> he was also really, really, really fantastic in the film, I thought. But um, yeah, Marissa Tomei just getting day drunk. Great stuff. <laughs> yeah. More of that, please. Yeah. 
And the kids didn't even bother me. Hey, I was just about to ask how you felt about child actors. <laughs> yeah, the younger one was a bit of a loss. Get rid of her. You know, she doesn't have a lot to do, though. Like, I think she's serviceable in what she does. Yeah, cut it. <laughs> Um, the scene where he goes to tattoo that kid is- Oh, God. <laughs> that's like- it, It's like you want to look away, but you can't. <laughs> it was pretty fantastic. Yeah. And then the line that comes later on about, it's like the second worst thing you can do to a kid in the woods. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Surely it's at, at most the third worst. Without diving too deep into this list. <laughs> I was going to say, have you started making a list? Well, actually, at, the, at the time, I was like, well, well, should we do like a top 10 countdown for our patrons or something? Yeah, okay, yeah. <laughs> Worst thing you can do to a kid in the woods, put him in front of a camera. <laughs> I actually, no, I thought this kid was great. He reminded me of, um, have you seen Parenthood? Yeah, but it's been it's been so oh, long. I was going to say, if you hadn't, I would have made us do it for a throwback because it's one of my favourites. Um, the little kid in that, Gary, who is kind of like, uh, you know, Keanu Reeves is his father figure in some ways. He reminded me of that kid. It's really good acting, I thought. Can you? What's what's your thoughts on this? Can you just walk into a fire station? I had the same thought. I have a feeling that in America you can because I know that like. You know, for example, the old thing about leaving your baby at the fire station. Like, There's a thing about that? Oh, yeah. Yeah, like if you're going to dump a baby, that's where you don't dump them at the police station or anything. You leave them on the steps of the, the, the fire department. Did you not know that? Isn't that a thing? Oh, well, having abandoned zero <laughs> babies. Look, I'm not saying that it happens often, but I'm just saying it's, it's, it's a thing I've heard is that babies get left at the fire department. Ah, so when you, when you were last Googling <laughs> where to leave my baby. No, I, I I love my children. <laughs> sometimes, some sometimes not tonight. She was a real shit tonight. <laughs> Good thing she's not old enough to listen to this yet. But in days to come, when well, not hopefully not days in years to come, when I'm on my deathbed and she's going through listening to these, you know, to kind of reminisce about what a dickhead I was. Mm. I love you, Ellie. <laughs> if you complain, you're out of the will. <laughs> um. No, I swear that that's a thing that I've heard, that, that you know, you leave babies. at, And I, I think that in the States, particularly in smaller towns, I feel like they are kind of very community-based fire stations. And I know that there's a lot of, like, volunteer firefighters and stuff. So, yeah, I think you can actually just kind of walk into them. They vote there, don't they? Do they? I've got, I've got a suspicion that in the US... Some <laughs> some fire stations are polling places. So this on, this, on election this episode has just turned into us talking about things that we suspect may happen at US fire stations. Yeah. I suspect you leave babies there. You suspect you vote there, possibly on the same day, even. <laughs> hey, two birds. Well, see, because here it's primary schools. I just assumed that that was universal because you know everywhere has a primary school. Some people probably think that's very strange. Yeah, maybe. I guess I never even thought of that. I mean. Hopefully they still have sausage sizzles over there on voting day. I don't think they have election day sausages. Well, that's just ridiculous. What's the point of going to vote if you don't get a sausage? The, the democracy sausage is the reason to vote. <laughs> yes, that's why. Well, that and it's mandatory here and you get fined. Well, yeah, that's, that's right. Here you have to. <laughs> but I would anyway because those sausages are good. But yeah, that scene where that big dude comes in with the shot slash stab wound- <laughs> That took me by surprise. Yeah. So you also in America, you don't go to hospital if you've got a stab wound. You go to the fire station. Well, I, I, I think that it was clear that that guy had been involved in illegal activities. So he didn't want to go to a hospital or police station or anything and, and admit what he was up to. I think he was just looking for someone who could help him. Also, here we have healthcare, so we can go to the hospital. <laughs> Sick burn. <laughs> Hit him where it hurts, man. <laughs> Getting back to the satellite cast of characters, Steve Buscemi being normal. Yeah. I was into it. I could maybe go for a bit more Steve Buscemi being normal on screen. I mean, it must have happened. He's not He's not abnormal a lot of the time. He's, he's pretty normal in Fargo. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay. I mean, he's, he's not, he's not like a, he's, I don't know. He's, he's fine, isn't he? 
I haven't watched Boardwalk Empire, but he seems pretty normal in the, the images, apart from wearing a bowler hat. But I think right. that was standard at the so time. So, gangsters and murderers, pretty normal for you. <laughs> so, okay. So, that's what you mean by normal. I mean, he's not always like Armageddon kind of off tap, but there's normally a kind of elevated aspect yeah. to Buscemi on screen, I find. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Whereas here, like I'm watching Steve Buscemi and I'm just like, oh, yeah, I know that guy. Yeah. Which I don't normally think about Steve Buscemi. Interesting bit of casting, too, having Steve Buscemi play a fireman when he did, in fact, act as a firefighter during 9-11. I, was, I, did, I did not know this until about three days ago. Yeah, he, he was a volunteer firefighter in 9-11, saved lives. Good for Steve. I will admit that when I first heard it, I was like, who was Steve picking up? <laughs> that's true. Guy's built like an elastic <laughs> band. Actually, that's a, that's a good point. You'd feel like he could barely lift the hose. <laughs> anyway, good for Steve. He was going to vote. <laughs> Got his days mixed up and was like, oh, fuck it, I'll, I'll volunteer. Um. I don't know if you know the the true story about Pete Davidson's dad, but it was actually 9-11 that he died as a firefighter. Yeah, so I'd heard that in the lead up to this film. Which is, it's interesting then that they don't choose to go down that route with the film. They, I mean, obviously, as you said, it's a, it's a semi-autobiographical. It's, it's kind of fictionalised to an extent. Um, but it's interesting that they didn't play up the 9-11-ness of it. It makes it more um, personal and intimate in a lot of ways, I think. Second week in a row, we've had someone from The Wire in a movie. I'm loving our little Wire run. This is great. (laughs) Who did we have this week? One of the firefighters. He would have been, I don't know, like, let's say early 40s, pretty big dude, um, bald. Oh, yeah, yeah, yep, yep. Yeah, one. Herc from The Wire. Right. i got to rewatch The Wire. I didn't think you'd seen it. (sighs) I haven't. (laughs) This was one of those moments where, you know, you know, like how like for years you just thought I'd seen The Godfather. I, I This was one of those things where I, I thought you thought I had seen it and I, I didn't want to get into a whole discussion about it. You know what would have, <laughs> if you just hadn't said anything, nothing would have happened, mate. <laughs> but now, now I'm in a hole, a shame yeah. hole. Hey, yeah, down in a hole. Good, good wire <laughs> reference, mate. Yes. Yeah. I knew, yeah. Omar. <laughs> I know my wire, mate. <laughs> All over it. <laughs> yeah, I'll uh, I'll tell you what. My wife is out at work. She's got like another three hours. So after we record, I'm going to watch some wire. Do it, man. Probably like, not. It, I'm probably going to watch a game show. Be the best show ever. Okay, I'll do it. So we did a little kind of uh, Apatow double feature the other day because due to this pesky pandemic that's getting around, there was a game of sports ball that we were going to watch, which got cancelled. Right after watching this, I was like, oh, well, we'll just do a um, an Apatow double feature and did this into Trainwreck. Oh, yes. Yep, yep, yep. Um, Amy Schumer. Amy Schumer. Well, th- 10 points. You got it. <laughs> Omar. <laughs> Omar. <laughs> uh, Pete Davidson's in Trainwreck for like five seconds. Yeah, yeah, he is. Yeah. Um, but anyway, watching, watching Trainwreck, uh, a film I quite like. Yeah, I like Trainwreck. I like it a lot. Trainwreck looks like a comedy. It, yes. it looks like a a better looking version of a sitcom. Yes. You know, front lit, colours are there, looks like a comedy. King of Staten Island is shot by Robert Ellswit, who won an Oscar for There Will Be Blood. And it does not really look like a comedy. It's a really well shot film, which is not a shock because Robert Ellswit <laughs> fucking shot it. Interesting choice to get. Robert Ellswit on board to do this film. As I was saying about, you know, how I feel about Apatow's career, when I think of an Apatow film, this is the kind of look that I picture. Correct me if I'm wrong, did he actually, did he direct Trainwreck or was he just a producer? Yeah, so this, yeah, because this is the first film he's directed since Trainwreck. Right, okay, well that surprises me because obviously he's, I feel like he's actually much better known as a producer than he is a director. But when I think of films that he has, especially films that he's had a hand in writing, now thinking about like funny people and this is 40, I I do tend to think that they are shot much more like a quirky drama than they are a straight comedy. So this is the kind of look I expect. But then, of course, you've also got like in the canon when you've got Step Brothers and Anchorman, which are- Again, you're just in, this looks like a comedy. 
So yeah, there is kind of a there is kind of a an Apatow divide in there between the the funny peoples and King of Staten Islands of this world. Yeah. And the Step Brothers. Which I recently watched. Uh fucking terrible film. Step Brothers? Yeah. It's been a long time since I've seen it, but I do remember laughing. I remember very much enjoying the um there's so much room for activities. <laughs> It's just a god awful film. <laughs> well, see, neither you or I famously very much like Will Ferrell. Yeah. Who, who's his stepbrother in it again? Is it Vince Vaughn? John C. Riley, who I really like. Yeah. I think John C. Riley is fantastic. I just don't like him in comedies. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, I'll, I'll, I'll agree with that. Yeah, for sure. I actually feel kind of the same way about Will Ferrell. I remember really liking him in um, Stranger Than Fiction. Stranger Than Fiction. Yeah. Yeah. As with most. Films of this ilk, character studies. By the end of the film, Pete Davidson is almost a changed man. He he has a relationship with a father figure type, and he's he's starting to move on with his life and and do things differently. And I really really liked the ending of this film where he goes to New York with his with his girlfriend. Um, I thought that was really touching. Where were you on the ending of the film? It was, it's kind of a, a weird, it's like in between a happy ending and, you know, where were you on that? I really liked that sequence too. Um, I thought Davidson was really good in that scene on the ferry. Yeah, yeah. I thought that was really quite affecting. And it's one of the main reasons why I would like for there to be less of some of the other threads is that, like, this is where the film ends. This is the- it's the emotional gut punch of the film, really, is is the ending point. And I'm like, wow, I've been away from her for a long time. Yeah, okay. And I really liked that character. And me too. I liked her a lot. It, it The first couple of scenes she was in, I was like, oh, damn, I know her. I know her. She was recently in, I don't know if you watched it, the new Apple TV Plus series, The Morning Show. And she's really fantastic in that too. So yeah, I thought she was really great, and I agree with you. The character was was there was a nice kind of yin and yang between her and Davidson, where they're not opposites, but there's just enough difference there that it's an interesting relationship to watch. I think. So yeah, I liked them together. Um, thought she was pretty fantastic, and like this is where the film ends, and like it's also where you know it started with them in that basement as well. Yeah, and I was like, I for me. I would have liked a more coherent thread of those two throughout the film. Okay. I I was actually pretty good with it. Thinking about it now that you said it, yes, there would have been quite a long time between her prior scene and this. Would would her prior scene have been the one where she's on the date with the other guy and walks out? It might have been. Yeah. Because I guess there is a lot of stuff of him in the fire station. From memory, that's almost like the last hour of the film. Yeah, that's that's the Eric Banner of, of this film. <laughs> yeah, and you don't see a lot of either her or Marissa Tomei or, or much of anything. That that last hour really is him and, and Ray. It's better than the Eric Banner stuff. <laughs> <laughs> but it, that's what it is with this Apatow film. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I, that didn't strike me at the time, but I can, I can see how you might have wanted a longer thread of them. Yeah. So here's a question. I, and I don't think this would be a question in a normal year just due to the the kind of film this is. But given the year we're in and where now streaming is eligible, do you see this getting any award play at all? I'll bet you 10 bucks this does not get nominated for Best Picture. Oh, no. No, it, it, it will not get nominated. This is an endgame, man. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, you coward. <laughs> Do you see this getting any award play at all? Um, you know, potentially there's a supporting performance that someone decides they like, potentially script. I would think that'd be about it. Yeah, I, I agree. I think to me this it sits in a similar boat with, say, the the big sick from a couple of years ago, which from memory was nominated for screenplay only, but yes, didn't win anything. Right. To me that's a shame because I think that was a, a really great film, but I could see this potentially getting a screenplay nod just kind of because of the source material and because Pete Davidson is an interesting guy. People like Apatow. And yeah, like if you're going to throw a supporting nom, maybe Marissa Tomei. I don't know. But yeah, I don't, I, I wouldn't even ask the question in a normal year, really. But I'll be curious to see if, if people do remember this film come awards time. Are they going to remember Bloodshot? 
<laughs> well, I hope they at least remember our man Guy. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. You got anything else left to say? No, I think I'm good. Okay. How how are you scoring this? Um, I quite enjoyed this. I, like certainly not without its faults for me, but I enjoyed it. Six out of ten. Yeah, okay. I'm a, I'm a seven out of ten. I probably could have even stretched to an eight, except that I do agree with you that the film, as with all Apatow films, is just too long. It's just definitely an Apatow film. It's just too long. So yeah, it's a seven for me. But I I definitely it's a recommend. All right. What do we get to do next week, buddy? Don't know, mate. We have no clue. Um, all right. Well, uh, Artemis Fowl just dropped on Disney+. Plus. That is meant to be <laughs> a genuine steaming pile. It is meant to be pretty bad, isn't it? Becky, new horror movie with um, Kevin James as, as the villain. Oh, the one where he's got a beard. Paul Blart, unemployed. <laughs> Any of those tickle your fancy, buddy? Ah, uh, we'll see. It, next next week is just going to be a surprise. We don't know. We'll, we'll, we'll leave it as a surprise for the listeners. Yep. All right. We're not deciding here and now. Okay. We will watch something, though. I'm happy to confirm that. We'll watch something. It could happen. <laughs> I mean, if we do a throwback, is it my turn? No, it's my turn. Oh. Because the last one we did, while the last one we did was No Country for Old Men, that was my win for Oscar tipping, not my turn at throwback. All right. In the meantime, if you want to get in touch with us, you can do that at wewatchedathing.com or wewatchedathing at gmail.com. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, all under the handle at wewatchedathing. If you want to help support the show, you can do that at patreon.com forward slash wewatchedathing, and we'll catch you next week. Watch a movie, folks. <laughs> <laughs>